and original. From Story Studio Network. Uh, once around the park, James, and don't spare the horses. <laughs> It's showtime. Well, here we go. Look at that. It is Friday, the 10th day of November 2023, in case you're taking notes at home. It's On The Ledge, your Ontario politics podcast. Dave Trafford here from Story Studio Network. John Wright is here from Maru Public Opinion. And Keith Leslie, you see and hear him regularly on CH Television. Also uh, happens to pop up from time to time on the O Show with Laura Babcock. So uh, fairly uh, fairly busy doing your commentary on what's going on at the park. Yeah, it's a good thing. It keeps me sharp, keeps me interested. And, uh, boy, there's been lots to talk about for some nope. strange reason. You know, it's, it's, I also get to do the Big Eight in Windsor. I just love oh, being on really? that station. Oh, you know, okay. it's one of the uh, – just uh, – it's got such a history of rock and roll, so to go on there and even just talk about Queen's Park, I love doing that as well. And uh, going with your uh, our Queen commenting on the opening of the show here, Once Around the Park, James, there's another Queen at Queen's Park now. The yes, stat- second I statue was revealed that. this week of Queen Elizabeth II. So something positive, it seems, for the Queen's day. Although, Park. Although, again, it's also controversial. You've got the, the – oh, one NDP MPP who says, well, you know, we don't need, a, should be in a museum. We don't need to honor Queen Elizabeth II. So nothing is without controversy these days. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting that, that there was all that unveiling of the, the statue, John, and the John A. McDonald uh, statue still all boarded up. So it's, you know, it's just. It's got a big chair, though. Yeah. You got you to gotta give it that. It's got a big chair. So maybe that makes it harder to pull it down. Yeah, all that is uh, of interest and of note, and certainly uh, doesn't take much to sort of scratch the surface before you get into uh, discussions around, you know, I, I'm offended by your being offended discussion. <laughs> we get down that, that hoop in a hurry, right? Even So I'm, I'm reading, I'm reading um, Sabrina and Angie's edition of the um, um, Queen's Park Observer this morning. And she was uh, talking to the uh, woman who's running for the NDP in uh, Kitchener Center. Is that where yep. it is? That's the election coming up. And, you know, she was completely blindsided by everything that went on in the legislature around uh, Sarah Jama, around Merritt Stiles, around the Riding Association calling for Stiles' resignation. Their candidate didn't even know about this. They didn't communicate that to the candidate. Um, I, I, I mean, you only got two feet to shoot yourself in, Keith. I don't know what, what, how much. I don't know how much worse it can get. You've got a flag bearer out knocking on doors for months and months and months in your writing. The by elections coming. The by elections been called, and you don't tell your candidate as the local writing association, or oh, you're going to call for the new leader of the party to resign because she screwed up the handling of the. Uh, MPP Sarah Jama and the Palestinian defense and her part and, you know, upsetting everyone in the center in the legislature. What, what, how can a candidate be out and be cut, just have the legs cut out underneath her for this? Uh, so, I mean, this is a writing the NDP desperately, desperately want to hold on to, but I think the Greens and the resurging Liberals both have a real shot at this writing now all of a sudden, especially when you see the NDP acting so stupidly to call for Merritt Stiles' resignation. She's only been in the job a little bit longer than Sarah Jama herself. And, you know, she had to handle a really difficult issue within the caucus. But they didn't, the NDP didn't want to censure Sarah Jama from speaking in the legislature. They just couldn't work with her in the caucus anymore. So to have this spill out into the by-election, and again, you did it to yourself. Mm-hmm. No one else is raising this issue in Kitchener Center, but the Riding Association for the NDP in Kitchener Center. What are you trying to achieve with this? Surely to God you could have spoke with Styles directly or maybe, maybe, Waited until after the by-election. Not that long. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and if you want to read it, it's a good piece. Uh, the check out uh, Sabrina's newsletter today, the Queen's Park Observer, and she does the sit down with uh, with Debbie Chapman. And you know, I can just and she kind of does the Q and A, John. And at one point where Chapman admits, I knew nothing about this, and the the, the obvious and pointed question that Sabrina asks was that awkward. <laughs> I don't know. It's the dysfunctionality of, uh, of uh, political parties that always amaze me at certain times. The riding associations are quite disconnected from the governing, govern, like the uh, the major parties. 
Um, they oftentimes get things very late, but honestly, this was a huge thing going on. And uh, it, it is surprising that uh, she didn't know about it whatsoever. I want to go back to just about, oh, I don't know, 16 seconds after we hit the stop button last Friday. Uh, and we had our chat on, on the ledge, and we were talking about all of the fun and games was going on. Within, I don't know, before an hour we had posted this show, um, we get word that the Auditor General, Keith, is going to look into Ontario Place and the Science Centre. And that was an, a bit of an out of the blue. We thought maybe the Integrity Commissioner might be looking up, but we certainly thought there's a possibility the RCMP. This is the interim Auditor General yep. looking into this. Well, clearly, someone in that office felt that there was enough public concern raised, and that's what they said. There was that a lot of members of the public brought this to the Auditor General's attention and said, this just doesn't look or smell right. And we need an Auditor General's probe of two, two separate probes here, one of Ontario Place and one of the Science Center and closing it and moving it to Ontario Place in a much reduced form. Both of which, of course, were just foisted upon people by the Ford government, including this 95-year lease for a private spa in Ontario Place. All of it, all of it just looks so bad, so opaque, so, you know, opposite of transparent. You just can't see any detail here that's going on at all. It begs for the Auditor General to go in and at least tell us some of the details and find out if it's good for taxpayers, if it's good for the public that this 95-year lease has been signed, that the Ontario Science Centre is going to be squashed and, and squeezed into a revitalized Ontario Place uh, uh, location. But, yeah, it's not going to be the main feature of Ontario Place anymore, that's for sure. Um, it, it just is the worst possible news for the Ford government uh, when you're already facing a, an RCMP investigation to your Greenbelt land swap. But it just proves that no one has any faith or trust in this government any longer not on these big projects that you're not telling us anything about other than here's what we're doing and we're going ahead and we're spending billions and billions of dollars on it or, you know, we're going to build a $500 billion parking garage for this spot, Ontario Place, and most of it's going to go underwater and we're going to cut down 800 trees. What? None of this sounds like it's in the public interest, really, to most people. So I think it's amazingly good news that the Auditor General is launching these two probes, good news for everyone except the Ford government. And remember, the legislature wasn't sitting this week. They won't be sitting Monday because of a Remembrance Day. So... Come Tuesday, they're going to start getting hammered all over again, and not just on the Green Belt, which, of course, we still have the RCMP investigation, but now on the Ontario Place and the Science Centre projects as well, which, both of which just look just like a government dictate coming down that, that no one asked for. Well, it's interesting, uh, John, because the, the local councillor, John Burnside here in Toronto, uh, his, the, the Science Centre falls in his ward, and, you know, he, he would love to see the Science Centre stay where it is, but he admits, you know, if we're going to keep this thing up, it's going to cost us about $100 million just to, you know, renovate, refit, revitalize the, the infrastructure. So, you know, his quote in the Star was, um, I'm not sure a value for money probe is really going to be all that compelling in terms of the um, Science Centre. But he's getting down on the weeds on this to that extent. What we have seen here. And when we've talked a little bit about this in the past, where the accountability offices have had next to no teeth, that has changed. They've had severe dental work in the last last six months, and they're they're taking a bite now. So where in the past you might have had a, an auditor general make a splash in the media or an integrity commissioner, et cetera, the, the, the whole body of work now is starting to have legs in, and foundationally they seem to be on a ground where they weren't really stable in, in the past in terms of public perception. Well, sure. Uh, you know, it wasn't too long ago where they were being accused, especially the auditor general of having a um, mission creep or uh, having a bias in terms of how things were uh, being done. In fact, even here, um, the three of us and Sabrina would have said that there clearly were some questions about whether the auditor general was in her lane or not. This is right up her alley. This is real serious stuff. And you know what? It, it feeds into the perception that it, unless you have an envelope with cash in it or you're a friend of this government, you're not going to get things. Now, if you lump this in with, and I don't know all the details of it, but the awarding of the contract for um, the COVID shots to exclusively to shoppers, there comes to be a point where Ontario Place, Green Belt, shoppers and probably a group of other things all kind of get grouped together 
And um, I don't know how the liberals are going to manage their campaign and who the leader is going to be, but this is all open fodder. This is stuff which is very biting and damaging. And you add to that the RCMP investigation, which may drag on for quite a while. We get bits of, of things that come out of that. That, that to me, is the political you know, target. That, that, to me, is the gaining together of a series of pieces which provide uh, not just a platform for the opposition parties, but a series of ongoing fires that the government is going to have to deal with. So, uh, again, the, the, the recent COVID issue and some of the other, I, I mean, COVID shot issue, plus some of the other issues that we're hearing about uh, in the background that haven't come to the fore yet. Um, this is a gathering storm and it's not going to go away anytime soon. Well, and Keith, we should probably, you know, kind of talk a little bit about that because what's happened here is that you've had pharmacies other than shoppers say, you know, that they, they, they aren't or they don't have access to the, the vaccines. And all of a sudden, this, this is a self-inflicted wound, it sounds like. Is it ever? I mean, all of a sudden, uh, three years into the uh, uh, COVID shots, the fall COVID, and, and how many years into the vaccine programs where we, we involved pharmacies, this government decided to give Shoppers Drug Mart and Galen Weston the distribution rights. So now Pharmasave has got to get its vaccine shots from Shoppers, mm-hmm. the competition. Well, you know right away they're getting a better cut. You know, they're getting more money than you are. Now, uh, the, the one pharmacist showed how he was getting these basically empty boxes or they'd get 20 shots instead of the 200 he was promised. And so he's wrapping up his, at a pharmacy, he's wrapping up his local vaccine program. I can't do it. Flu shots and COVID shots because I'm not getting proper distribution. Why did they? Apparently, this was a sole source contract. Although the government says it was put out for tender, but why would we change the di- distribution process for the vaccines, which had been working pretty darn well? I mean, there were complaints about rollout, but not as bad this year. The ph- other pharmacists are saying this is the worst rollout they've seen, unless you're a shopper's pharmacist. So, what on earth is the deal with Doug Ford? Well, Timmy's we know, but shoppers as well, and. Uh, I was, I know you guys are too young to have experienced this, but when I went to get my senior's Presto card, I went to the TTC office at Young and Bloor, the big main floor one, and I said, I want a Presto card. And they said, well, you can buy it in the machine behind you. I said, no, no, I want a senior's one. They said, oh, you have to go to Shoppers Drug Mart to get that and give them $6. What? And the woman in the TTC booth was kind of just shocking her, shaking her head as, as she said, yeah, I can't sell you one. You have to go to Shoppers Drug Mart and give them $6. What is with this? That adds up $6 a little extra fee for shoppers to administer something that the TTC, the woman was standing right there, clearly could have sold me this. Giving them the distribution rights to vaccines three years into a COVID uh, vaccine program that had been, as I say, not perfect, but doing pretty well. People had gotten used to it. And now they're finding their local pharmacy. They make an appointment and it has to be canceled. The pharmacist says he has to triage. He know, he's getting 20 shots instead of the 200 he was promised. So he has to go. He's got people that are really compromised. He wants to get them, but he has to cancel a bunch of them. No wonder they're getting out of this. What was the purpose in this again, other than to give shoppers a little bit more money to make Gill and Weston just that little bit more rich? What on earth are we thinking here? I don't get it. I really don't get it. Well, you know, John, if, if you know, there may have been some political currency that the premier gained through COVID. And, and we saw his numbers go up in terms of how the government managed and handled things. And yes, there were problems, but, you know, it was kind of like a wartime premier and, 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 and there was that re- re- reflex. Now we should be looking and saying, what the hell did we not learn here because of what's gone on COVID? And, and like it really is tone deaf and, and, and quite frankly, blind to what's been going on. Well, it's also the case is there's really been no response, right? There hasn't been. Yeah, yeah. You know, the health minister as well has always been. Um, and who is she? Who, 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 exactly. who is I mean, she? She doesn't, speak, she doesn't want She's to. Deputy do Premier it. now. Um, I, I go back to this and just say that I, I, I think this plus a few other things that are burbling behind the scenes will also just keep this momentum going in terms of a perception of the government. Now, we're a long way away from an election campaign. And even. You know, I've said this, I'll say it again. Even when you look federally at, uh, at, at Justin Trudeau's numbers, I mean, the deal itself with the NDP does not conclude you're ready until October of 2025. Hello? And the Liberals 48 hours ago uh, announced their campaign re-election uh, team, which is probably as much to send a signal as it is anything else that Justin's sticking around. 
But, you know, we have a long way to go with all of this. And we did see after they'd made the decision about rescinding the Greenbelt um, uh, things that the, the the numbers for the Tories rebounded in Ontario. I mean, Ford went back up to around 40 percent. But that leads us then to the next conversation about what are the Liberals doing? What are the candidates doing um, out there? And, you know, I, I, democracy is a messy thing, isn't it? It, it, it actually is a, is a great, wonderful, organic process. I don't know how the Liberals are going to do, but right now it, it, it's an interesting situation where you've got a front runner who is probably very palatable to most of the people in Ontario. And now we've got, uh, you know, two of the candidates stepping forward saying on the ranked ballot, give it to him or give it to me. So it's, it, I mean, it's very interesting what where we're going to be potentially um, in the next uh, couple of years. But this, I think, is going to follow them. Like there's a, there's a narrative now that's very, very pronounced and it's going to continue, especially, you know what, you know, the, the Auditor General, after she's finished one on Ontario Place, the COVID shot one and distribution is the next one. There it, you just, go. it just right. trips yeah, yeah. over one after the other. Yeah. Um, I want to get to the uh, liberal uh, leadership uh, in a second, but uh, one of the things that we talked about maybe a couple of weeks ago was the whole idea of the province entertaining the ideas of uh, uploading the mm. Don Valley Parkway, Gardner Expressway from Toronto to the province. This week, we're hearing based on, uh, I guess it was the Canadian press did a, an FOI and they found some documents that suggested that who we may have to be running two of the LRT lines. That is we, the province in Toronto because Toronto has no money. Um, we can't really operate these and you know, let's face it. Shovels are in the ground. We're way overdue on the, uh, cross town on Eglinton. Then there's the one further North. Um, uh, Keith, this all sounds to me. Like Mayor Chow has just got her bulldozer just full of stuff and she's just pushed it all onto the table and said, we can't afford this. See ya. And backed away. Well, Highways, transit, all of, the, all of that infrastructure that we so desperately need to work properly and well and now in the city for the whole benefit of the, of the entire region. Um, it, this all sounds like a really obvious negotiation thing that she's just pushing all her chips on the table. Well, she's basically saying, I mean, you know, it had to come out in these memos, these emails that are going back and forth, but basically these new transit lines that you're paying for, you're going to run because we cannot afford to run them. And let's face it, transit, public transit, really needs the higher levels of government to fund it. We've known this for decades. And, and since it's been, you know, the TTC relying on fares in the city budget, it's just not going to last. So she's being extremely smart here. But she also just, you know, I, I think, as you say, she's got that bulldozer. She's plowing everything out under the table and, and asking for She also unveiled a $36 billion housing plan with no money to put with behind no money. it. No. So these are great plans. I have some. And if I can get higher <laughs> levels of funding from other governments, we're going to be great. I'm telling you, we're going to be fantastic. So and we'll talk about them on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so she's absolutely smart. And I think she has a very valid point about these new transit lines and about the city just running. As I say, transit funding needs to be not just one-offs, either helping the province out or helping the city out every year, uh, helping the TCC, you know, balance its books. No, it's got to become permanent funding from the provincial government. And maybe, I don't know, maybe some federal government, you know, there's some partnership in there as well, because Toronto is unique. It has a unique transit system to all of the country. And it, it should be treated differently, I think, in this particular case. It has to be. Other issues that the mayor is trying to get, you know, her support for, well, that's it. And we, we see how these jurisdictional battles come out when we saw uh, Sean Fraser, the federal housing minister, come in and give the city of Toronto some money. And Doug Ford says, wait, stop doing that. Yeah. And other premiers, he's not just Doug Ford as well. Other premiers, he's state of our provincial stuff. Stop making deals with these cities. And, of course, what are the cities saying? Well, you're not giving us any money. You're taking it away. He's coming in, giving us money, and we're putting shovels in. Like, it's it's happening. It's an action plan now. The guy's been on the job, what, three, four months? He's getting rave reviews from the very mayors that this government wants to, and needs to work with. And we've already got another Canadian press story today. They're doing well that several of the mayors have just flat out rejected these strong mayor powers, even though by doing so, it means they're not going to be able to get a cut of the housing budget that the government has set up to compensate them for the fees that eliminated, the development fees that it eliminated. Uh, you have to meet your provincial targets. And they're saying there's, there's sort of two reasons. One, we can't meet those targets. We don't actually get to say when the shovels go in the ground. We issue permits. The other thing is 
We don't want to become a dictator. And the council have even said, well, we like the current mayor. We don't want the next one's not going to. And it, these strong mayor powers are being rejected, as is the money. From the, we can't meet your targets. The, uh, one municipality's got a target of 12,000 homes. They said, we can do 6,000. We can do half that. But we can't control when the shovels go in the grounds. All of this comes right back to Doug Ford rejecting federal money for housing. I mean, we already had another report this week that the Star didn't investigate thing into the ministerial zoning orders that were given out like candy. And they just looked at the first couple years. They didn't even look at the more recent ones and found that basically they were absolutely useless for getting housing built, but they were great for helping developers bypass on Ontario land tribunal hearings and for getting environmental regulations changed or lifted completely. And so, to spike the, the the actual value of the property. Oh, that just drives it right up, yeah, right? And yet, no housing. They went and looked specifically at the lots of lands, all these MZOs, I think they're like 18 specifically, two had something built on them. It's just a joke. Again, just showing that this Ford government's, you know, it's claimed to have the housing priority and all that. Well, yes, it, it may be your top priority, <clears throat> but your ways of going about it, you haven't shown us a correct one yet. Every one seems to be flawed. Every single mm-hmm. one seems to be flawed and delaying the building of housing. You're way off your target, and it looks now like you're never going to meet it. Well, and I think it was uh, the mayor of uh, Newmarket, John, was saying, I don't want the strong uh, mayor powers because, again, to Keith's point, um, it's, it, it doesn't help me because – it might get housing built, but it's not going to get sewers built. And we need the sewers before we have the houses. So that whole infrastructure might not be sexy, but holy cow, you put a house on there without a toilet. I'm telling you, that's a political issue. But it also emphasizes the fact that in a post-COVID world, and granted it was going on beforehand, but particularly in a post-COVID world, governments are just not knit together to kind of coordinate or get things done. I mean, it's almost by fiat that it's a little bit like when <clears throat> Rogers was given the sole contract to do the Wi-Fi in the subways. I mean, it's like there was a hue and cry because you knew it, automatically there was going to be a problem for anybody that had a bell. And then it went to a decision and then a forced political thing. It's kind of like, guys, look, it, housing is the most important issue for our cities. Density is. We have immigration needs. We have all these sort of things. I don't. You know, we had the, the, the premier's meeting and we have healthcare ministers meeting around particular issues, but I don't see any level of coordination at all on the most important issue facing people today. Like there isn't any. I mean, to the common person in the street and, and sorry for those who are, up, you know, uh, up to their necks in this issue, but for the common person in the street, they look at strip mall areas that are abandoned in different cities. They look at areas that could be automatically rehabilitated and they say why are we talking about stuff outside of cities when in fact there's even things that are available inside of cities and it then comes down to the city itself in terms of getting the orders actually approved to move forward it's a very complicated situation i i get that but there are so many times when in the past number of years the federal government in particular has announced a whole bunch of stuff with nothing behind it i mean the the, the trudeau government is more show than go but this is now happening across the board where you're getting the provincial government and others involved in really serious issues for the public. And there is no coordination. There's no summit. There's no getting together to knit the whole thing together. And I, I think this is, this is maybe the post-COVID world we live in. But none of this is going to get done. You and I know that. Anybody who's listening to this, it's not coming together. There's no leadership to bring it together. And as a result... It's just a lot of announcements and no substance. And even at the end of the day, the houses that we were talking about were all going to be millions and millions of dollars to to buy. That doesn't do anything for affordable housing. So something is missing from this process. And it's more than just politics. There's just no bringing together of the parties to actually work things out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and we could we could go down that path on a whole bunch of files, whether it's healthcare or housing or education. I mean that you're right in in so many respects. Uh, I even have that, you know, in the back of my head when, we, when I hear everybody finally getting around to the conversation that you know I think we probably talked about it three or four years ago. What do you do with all the downtown towers that aren't going to be populated anymore? Nine to five. Well, can you convert them to? residential housing the answer is maybe right and 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 we're back to regulations bylaws all of that building code stuff we're back to toilets down- there's not enough toilets well like, we're, we're right right and if, the funny thing is when i started to read into that in some of those towers the the biggest problem is there are too many elevators 
Too many elevators. You're too far away from windows. You, you would have to hollow out some of those buildings. So it's all great to be waving the flag, and we could do that and, and, and you know, create more uh, supply and housing. The problem is they aren't going to be affordable housing. <laughs> I mean, they're, just, they're just not. So, you know, it, we, we end up in this bumper sticker kind of campaign mode all the time. And we're not, to your point, John. Uh, getting anything done. Um, before we go, I want to I want to weigh in on what's going on with the liberal leadership mm. uh, campaign. We had Erskine Smith and and Nackby yesterday, uh, that is Thursday of this week, uh, meet the media and say, "We have decided we're going to coalesce, and on the ranked ballot, we are encouraging our supporters to put the other guy as their second choice on the ballot." And all of the media analysis this morning I, I've heard is, you know, they, they somehow think that they're going to win doing this. Keith, correct me if I'm wrong. But for that to work, either Erskine Smith or Nackby would have to finish fourth mm. in the first ballot for those second votes to go to the other guy on the second ballot, right? This is exactly. This is exactly okay, so what they let, say. Let me just do that. Yep. For one, okay, I got that right. So then it means that they have admittedly said that one of us is going to lose Correct. badly. Correct. <laughs> Absolutely. Correct. This is exactly what they say. It isn't. It's an ABC. Any, anybody, anybody but, but Crombie. Crombie. And yeah. it obviously is. Uh, and uh, I thought it was kind of interesting to see. I know there's you know a lot of camps already. And the liberals have all fanned out into the different leadership camps. But Dwight Duncan, the former finance minister who was a cabinet colleague of Yasser Nakvi when he was attorney general of Ontario, Said it smacks of desperation. And I think that's it. As you point out, they're conceding one of them is, is going to lose. They both insist no one's going to win on the first ballot. Perhaps that's so because there's so many committed, delega- not delegates, committed voters to them. But I think with an open voting process like this, somebody can indeed win on the first ballot. And I think Bonnie Crombie's strength is such with the voters. Now, we don't know. We can't poll just liberal voters at this point, registered voters. But it seems her strength is strong enough that she perhaps could win on the first ballot. And if she's not your first choice, why would you pick Nackby or or, uh, Erskine Smith over her for your second choice? Because they haven't proven, you know, she seems to be the one that most gets under Doug Ford's skin. We've seen the Fed or the provincial conservatives target her and basically ignore the rest of them. It's not because they want her as their adversary, as their liberal leader. They don't. They think she's the most damaging to them. That's my read of it anyway. Guess who's going to be sitting well, in the back bench for the rest of their lives? I mean, I look. Politics is is strange, isn't it? Um, and and you get people who you know haven't got a chance of even winning the electorate publicly. And I, I'm not condemning them as as people. I'm just saying when you look at it and what you are faced with going against Doug Ford and the machinery of of that campaign team. You don't want any flaws whatsoever, and you want a strong leader, and you want someone who can communicate really, really well. The demonstration yesterday was that these two candidates, as as good as they are uh, in their own ways, and I've heard great things about them personally out in the writings and stuff like that, it's naive. Like, it just shows that the liberals, in fact, are going into a convention, but sorry, in, in, a, in a vote um, where it's all about them and not about the party. So I, I get all of that. But these two characters are, you know, at the end of the day, the chances of them winning are not very good, which means that they have just likely offended the campaign team um, who's going to elect the leader, which means that bye bye Like, that's just the way politics works. I'd I'd be very surprised if they end up on cabinet or something like that. So even the calculus in that is seen to be a bit naive. That's all. Well, even at that, John, I mean, right now they're not, they're not even no. provincial members. So no. they're no. in the federal, federal legislature. Uh, if Crombie wins or if they don't win, it's highly unlikely that they're going to run provincially. So the, right. the, 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 this again, back to self inflicted wounds. Uh, so, but I'll leave it on this. And this was the quote that I found in Sabrina's newsletter this morning. And it's from Noah uh, Zatzman. And uh, he used to work in uh, Kathleen Wynn's office, now working for Crombie. He said, someone explain to me why Yasser and Nate are tougher on Bonnie than Hamas. Oh. Oof. Yeah. Wow. Okay. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> that, that wound will, <laughs> will, will heal quickly. Uh, but, you know, yeah, there you go. That's uh, to your point, John. Politics is strange. All right, we'll leave it there. That is the Friday edition of On the Ledge, your Ontario politics podcast. 
for Story Studio Network. This is SSN. Story Studio Network.